Hey guys, I'm Sai, and welcome to Ace Podcast Nation, the home of the Danny Batten Fight Show. This is episode number 72, and tonight we're going to be talking the latest MMA news and uh, some boxing and MMA for the last couple of days. It, uh, there's certainly been a lot of it, and uh, there's certainly been some newsworthy fights and stories to talk about, as well as uh, we'll be having a chat with another top guest from the combat sports world. But uh, as usual, you can watch this video or this show and all the other shows we do at Ace Podcast Nation, uh, youtube.com slash Ace Podcast Nation. Click the bell for notifications, subscribe, and uh, if you prefer your podcasts in audio form, you can download them at all the podcast platforms. Just search Ace Podcast Nation and you'll find uh, over 70 Danny Batten fight shows as well as over 400 shows on various uh, subjects and and uh, different guests and whatnot, so plenty of content there with uh, top guests, expert analysts, and more. Uh, and of course, you can follow the Danny Batten Fight Show on Twitter and Instagram uh, at Danny Batten FS. But uh, with no further ado, let's get into it. Joining me as ever, former Cage Warriors champion, UK MMA legend, Mr. Danny Batten. Welcome, my friend. How are you? Yeah, yeah, really good. I'm enjoying this improving weather. It's nice that it's started to warm up a little bit, isn't it? Cause it's yes, mate. been another cold spell we've been through. And what a weekend as well. Lots of different things going on in the combat world. Uh, with a little touch of boxing, if you can call it that. And mm. um, Bellator's and UFC, action-packed. Yeah, loads to talk about, mate. Um, not all good, unfortunately. But then you can't have everything good. As a lot of decisions on that UFC card last night. Which uh, was interesting. I do a good card, though, good fights. But um, joining us today, tonight, tonight's guest is uh, Welsh bantamweight, currently signed with Brave, and it is uh, Mr. Aidan James. Welcome, mate. How are you? Guys. I'm good, guys. How are you? All good, mate. All good. So yeah, it's uh, been a, an interesting weekend of combat sports. Um, so we'll we'll do some predictions for next week's UFC, which is that looks like a proper card of uh, of fights. None of this. Uh, what would you call it, Danny? Circus, circus, uh, circus fights, I suppose. But, yeah, um, yeah, no. Yeah, we got some serious card coming up, haven't we? Yeah, no, yeah. Next week's a proper card of uh, fights. So we'll get into into the boxing and the MMA in just a minute, but we'll have a chat to our guest first and foremost. Um, Aidan, how old were you when you like first started in MMA and training and stuff like that, mate? Um, so like MMA probably, I'd say, like if I suppose everyone when you start training properly, I'd say nineteen. Like I um moved to Swansea. I'm from Merthyr, so obviously around to you know from the valley. Like I'm from Merthyr. I moved to Swansea train with um Chris Priest and uh Brett on to find and obviously now Andrew Williams I trained down there who um we didn't really have any like MA in there so or, or in gym to be honest. There was nothing there. Um so I moved like there's like some boxing gyms like obviously known for boxers there's uh several quite well, I think it's three or four real good IL boxers from Murphy um over the years. Then um uh like you got kick boxing and judo but nothing special so I was just young and I moved down, but I was another gym, but it was just, it was just like, do an arm bar, do a triangle, it's a pad, but I didn't, I didn't know there was guards, so I came down mm. with my white belt with Chris, mm. and uh, I started doing jiu jitsu properly, and I fell in love with jiu-jitsu then, in the sport, so I'd say 19, but um, my fam, my mother, I got my mother, she's a like combat man, she loves like boxing and me, so she was always just like, just at me at pad, like I'd bunch off school and she'd just be padding me in, in the garden mm. and stuff, and like, this, just, just, Scared me away as well, also because it was like it was just that she was a bit uh, wary of like someone would pick a fight me if I wasn't able to handle myself. So yeah, she was trying to teach me something. But then I started, I started really enjoying as I got older, watching UFC and wanting to do the sport that I was watching all the time. Now that's quite interesting, isn't it? Because like often you don't necessarily people don't necessarily assume or 
that it's you know like the mum who's really into combat sports and stuff yeah. like that so um that's like I, I like that i like that a lot actually it's um so you just started training at sort of 19 were you all were you like always into boxing and mma though before you started training in it yeah so watching the sport yeah i i love like i think one of the first um so i remember do you want that a cabbage west westy quick career yeah, yeah. Told me I was a kid and I just loved this like like fat guy who just <laughs> mauling people like <laughs> I thought he was class and um I, I enjoyed him and also uh do you remember Andre Lossi when he was fuck it I mean he fought last night but uh he was young I mean he had the th- fang gum shields. Yeah um, yeah if you're if you're like eight, nine years old, a fan gum shields, do you know I mean that's rock solid cool, like yeah. I thought it was amazing. So <laughs> and then I watch him spark someone I think it was like Paul Bentel might be like just an old van right in like a few seconds and I just fell in love. And then when GSP started coming to his prime, like I was probably a little fanboy of GSP growing up. Still am. But Yeah. I was proper I was a fan mainly. And it, I but really I as much as I watched, I weren't interested in fighting. Like I gained little scuffles when I was a kid. And like from the year from it was just inevitable it would happen but I never was like oh I'm going to be this one I wasn't even sporty I was a nerd I just love the Xbox and playing yeah. the, the, read the most space and stuff but as I got a bit older then things would happen and changes would cause and go down more yeah so it's, that's it isn't it like what you're interested in as a kid it doesn't always translate to where you go as uh, you get to your late teens and you're no. into adulthood what would you mentioned like gsp and you um alofsky what about like influences on you as a fighter just not necessarily from like uh you know like people you watch but like people who train you and and who are in your day-to-day life who would you say has got the biggest influences on you um so also when i first moved down um i knew who brett was and watched him like do a couple of things um i think i actually just as i was moving i was planning to move down he's gonna affect or two he had just he was just fighting for the cage warriors uh four man tournament they only won the title yeah yeah um so like i spoke to him and i was like but i was like jimmy you know, i looked at him and i was like oh my god that's right john's like oh mm-hmm. that was great yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was like, oh, that's, that's Brett John's like, and my my head was like, and um, he just finished a session, and um, I, I was I, I was like with this lad who was with me, he's like, oh, go on, speak to Brett. So I said, I was like, mm-hmm. Brett, I was like, uh, have you got have you got any tips for me? Like, I want to I want to start a mate, and he was like lying on the floor, he was like punching his back. I was like, oh. Yeah, I got one. I went, what? I went, don't do it. And just walked off. <laughs> I was like, oh, Brett. <laughs> Never mind then, like I'll just leave this alone. So I, I, I called my car, like I was thinking, fuck, like he don't look like he enjoys this. He's fighting for a world title next week, and um, he doesn't look like he wants to do it. But basically, he was in bed. He was in fight camp, wasn't he? Yeah. And he just done like ten fives, doing whatever. Like so, um, I mean, that was the first he said. We just did nothing. <laughs> he was like, yeah, don't do it. It's left. But um, <laughs> yeah. So I ended up like, but anyway, he, I, I won the, he won the tournament, like, and I moved down, and uh, we become really good close friends like at the time so I like I he in front of me I was like watching him train and like do what he was doing like just grinding it out and like um because I moved from Merth and Swansea obviously like I had nothing money wise so I had like like I was renting a house I was working part time in school fix and I had, like just a mattress on the floor I had two matches mm. and I, I split the mattress and met Brett so because he didn't have a car even though he's a cage was your champion against if you think of, like Daniel Terry, there's no, there's no money there to start, is there? Like, especially with kids, no. quite big bucks. Like, so Brett was sleeping in a gym, or, or like, he'd, like, he'd come over my house and we'd split the mat, like, I'd give him one mat, because I'd two on top of each other, just on the floor, and we'd train. But then, um, yeah, so I, I learned, I had a big influence off Brett at the start, and, like, seen his, like, his work ethic. Then, um, over the years then, like, obviously, I, like I said, I'd done little bits, in Merthyr, but I'd never click on the one, but Chris, I just clicked with quite, quite quick, like, um, mm. it's, it's quite hard to explain, but any athlete or any coach will know, like, something just work with someone, I can't explain it, it's just, it's like a tangible thing, but it's not something I can just explain out, but we were just, like, communicating things, we got bounced off really well, and I didn't, just, I knew you understood how I thought and felt, I never, I never needed, like, that coach to scream and shout, like, oh, you got, you're gonna kill him. This is it. Like, do you know I me. Mean? This is you gotta do. Like, I need someone to be calm and like I want the, the advice that I need and Stra- I need strategy and stuff. Yeah. yeah. So I, I bounce with Chris. So me and Chris, like, uh, we're very close. Well, we talk, we talked a lot and like, um, 
along with his thinking and his thought process help to guide the way I think about things in myself because I'm bit ADHD like so my brain can pop a spiral really yeah. hard and then um, another big influence on me down here today is um, my jiu-jitsu coach Ashley Williams now Ash didn't come into it a little bit later on so I learned more of my jiu-jitsu off Chris up until like uh, purple I'd say purple belt and then or blue, blue to purple, and then Ash came back because he was a student in Cardiff and come back to Swansea so I keep doing full time. And we had a bit of a rocky start to be fair uh, when he first moved here, like uh, come back. We didn't quite click, and mm. uh, obviously he was coming back to his gym, and I was just like this little this wild child, like, and uh, I didn't understand the way he would teach us things. But now like we get on really, like we are very close friends. I mean, business part as well. Like I'm, I have one with him. Uh, yeah. So, is with, with the guys and his thought was like he's a super smart guy. Uh, mm. I don't think I've ever met Ash, but if you ever do meet him, like he's no, very, I haven't no. very uh, he's crazy intelligent. But his ability to break things down and see stuff, it's, it's not just with jiu-jitsu or everything, like he's got a degree in astrophysics. Wow, is, yeah, I know, but uh, he doesn't use it all. I mean, he's just telling me what to do half the time. Yeah, he can see he's got a very analytical mind. So when we like discuss techniques or business or anything like I can see his way his brain works and explains as well so he's been another big influence to me um, and then I've, I've a couple of guys on the way I tend to pick up things off like um, especially if I've trained somewhere or someone like you it's quite weird in like one off encounters I end up learning this thing or mm. see think um, and then I, I just watch a lot of videos I know it sounds crazy but I, I like I'm like the YouTube generation and I start with sitting yeah. sitting when I try and describe it, but um, I've watched so much fights, like especially growing up, like come from like when I moved down, I just watch videos and then like see some do technique and I just go try a spar and just try it over and over again. And if I liked it, I kept, and if I didn't, I didn't try it again. Yeah, I think um, that's the one or one of the benefits which today's generation of fighters have got over someone like in your generation, Dan, is that you can pretty much watch any fight from any era at the touch of a button. So you can learn a lot quite quickly. But um, the one thing I wanted to, to ask you, Dan, actually, but something which um, Aiden just said there about his coach, uh, Ashley. And funny enough, um, Aiden, I would I would like to get um, Chris and Ashley on at some point because I think I've heard really good things oh, yeah. about both guys. Like, But uh, like one thing, um, Danny, which interested well, not one thing, but like interested me there was, like he said, he didn't get on with um, Ashley when he first started doing the you know, started being his coach and that. And that's one thing I think that we don't always think about is that maybe coach and student relationship isn't always plain sailing and, and, and you know, it isn't always um, that you get on really well. It can be a, like a bit of a rocky start. Like, how difficult is that to navigate as a coach? Yeah, that's obviously part of the conundrum you know, of being a coach is trying to gel with so many multiple different personalities and, and England being the way it is now in its present form you've got many different cultural backgrounds that you have to sort of like take into account when you're training with people um, but that comes down to people skills and yeah. you know personally I think I can mingle in with most types of people and, and and find a way to fit into most people's way of thinking but nevertheless you know some people will choose another coach over another coach partly because of how they get on and the relationship and how they explain things you know that's always going to be a, a variable that a student will have to take into account when they decide where they're going to sort of like settle as their main sort of training gym and what, and what have you but yeah it does have its challenges um absolutely that but if you ever um, had a student danny which you like don't get on with yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't have to name them, like, but no, just, no, no, just no. interested. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Why yeah, didn't you like them? Uh, I've had fallings out with students, really, uh, because of the way they conducted themselves more with the other students. Um, oh, so okay, you get some yeah. guys that are, are bigger than others, and as they begin to get technically better, um, they, they'll predominantly spar with people smaller than themselves, pulling them yeah. to one side, doing excess rounds with them, going excessively hard. Um, and also showing temper when things don't go their way, you know, yeah. so yeah. I do spot this with students and I'll be like, hey, so-and-so, you know, get in there and do a round with, with Frank, you know, just because he's mm. more your size. And then when it ain't going his way, you know, throw a wobbly and, you know, uh, get, get uh, mouthy. Uh, yeah, I've had yeah. all of that, experienced all sort of things. Um, I've kicked people out of the gym. 
uh, before. You know, but this is a real rarity. I, I must say, you know, we're talking about a t- subject that really, mm. to the extreme, comes up very, very few times. Yeah, and, well, I, we've uh, always said Modestus is a he's hard work and he's a nasty piece of work, and he so. <laughs> no, no, no. No, I'm not joking. But, no, no, no. But yeah, it, it, it's certainly interesting. It's a part that people don't it's really part take into it, account, well, isn't it? Yeah, people just. But think that's that, what. Yeah. Um, sorry, mate. That's what interested me about kind of what Aidan said. It's just, that's not um, like that's not necessarily a subject which we've talked about a lot within the coaching realm and stuff. You know, when we've touched on different aspects of coaching, like not getting on with someone. Because you know, with whatever your job is, if it's a nine to five, or you work in a shop, or you work in a pub, there's always someone you don't get on with. But you've got to learn to find common grounds to do your job. And I think when you're trying to teach someone, it's difficult, isn't it? Because yeah. they, everybody needs stuff explained in a way that they can relate to or they understand so that they can then put it into practice and probably with fighting and and jujitsu and things like this like martial arts it's it's probably even more so because you really have got to take it and put it into practice yourself people can't do it for you um i think a a part of it comes from a a belief as well so like i think that's where where, when ash first came to our gym back to the gym to be my like he he was chris is like one of his main first students before Mm. I was there, but he'd left the Cardiff to go to university, he was after his degree, but also he's like teaching in Cardiff. Hmm. So when we keep, like, originally, like, I'd seen him in the gym a few times, he'd had some roles, and he'd like, to me, a training partner. And I didn't, yeah. like, when he first came, um, he was coming more, like, one as a business partner, but two was, like, a coach equal to Chris, but he had, like, earn his position. Hmm. And I think for a lot of, like, especially the younger boys, like myself, as well, Pets, and those, I still was, like, we didn't quite get it. Like we still need yeah. a partner, but now he's coaching us. But now I, I see him fully as a coach. But at the start, like, I, like I didn't. I just, does he know? Like in my head, like I didn't fully believe what he was saying. So like, it weren't so much that like we'd have an attitude problem. Where like I, I'm hundred percent get what Danny means. Like, like I coach myself now, and like then things do come up where you get guys you, you have to keep an eye on. But it was more to do with like I didn't quite believe him coaching. Yeah. Was, like nah, like I call Chris my coach. But now, like I'm, like I totally see Ash as like uh, a close friend, but also a coach. And I, I, if he says to do something, I would do it hundred percent. But that's a very like we've worked on our relationship all together, but yeah. like, hard to build that up. What's um, what's it been like training throughout uh, throughout COVID? Aid? And like obviously, it's been different for everybody. It's been difficult. Mm. Some people have had more access to you know gyms and stuff than others, and it is it's been it's been a trying time, isn't it? So like the issue, so I obviously I, help, I obviously run the gym with the guys, so I have access with them seven. But um, a lot of the fighters left the gym um, uh, just before lockdown. Like literally, it was like obviously they didn't know lockdown was coming, but they like left like like the end of February or start of March, then with a lockdown. So I lost like a lot of guys that, that I was training with left the gym, which meant that I lost my like main MMA sparring partners, mm. and then. Um, but I think come back up. Like I have a lot of good grappling partners to hold that, and I will try and if I can, I will travel to meet guys. Like we fought Ben Ellis only before, so I uh, me and Ben Ellis picked up regularly and we sparred and we get stuff done. Um, I got another yeah, a, a lad to roll Evans. Like he's he's a, he, he is actually super skillful. Like he got a couple of nicks in his record, just people would overlook him now, which I hope they do. But he's, he's legit, like, mm. and then um. I'm gonna look to uh, I spoke like uh, my conditioning coach Chris Meyer trained up in Birmingham, so I might look to go up to Birmingham do some training soon. And same with I spoke to man uh, Aaron Abbey, Aaron Abbey, we'll get some training. So like right now it's been like I'm doing what I can. I look to Chris, we like we do our wheel roll pads and do our things. I'll go over action again. Like he's, he's a three time, or he's a three week guy, three week class class world champion. So I've got a real good idea of partner. And his, his, his ability to see grappling for me is very good. So it's not, he's not like, he's not that jiu jitsu course, like, right, we're going to put a Della Heber in here and we're going to do this. Like, that's not the ram. Like, he understands grappling for me. Um, so, yeah, I do get, I still, I'm still training, I'm still getting what I can in. And I'm just doing, like, I do a lot of, um, especially now, like, I try to study a bit more. I always studied as an amateur, but then mm. when I went pro, I didn't study as much. And, okay. uh, like, so, like, some fighters treat, like, fighting like a nine to five and they go to the gym, they do a session and they go home and put you off and it works for them and that's brilliant if that's the way it is. 
But for me, like, because it's always in my head, I'm always watching stuff and techniques. So, like, I'll go home, especially when I was an amateur as well, I was crazy for it. But I'd watch every amateur in my weight class, above and below. So I'd watch all the featherweights, all the lightweights, and all the bantamweights, just in case anyone come up or down. Uh, I'd study the amateur and then I'd study pros. Then, like, if I am... Um, so, like, when I was fighting um, uh, Franz Malambo, I was, he was a good boxer, so I was, like... I want to try and fight him like GSP would. I'm not not saying I was a GSP, no, I'm not saying that, but I was like, how would GSP deal with like long rangey strikers and I'd study some of his tactics and see if they worked sparring. And then I would love to fight a similar build to me in the respective weight class and see the like, techniques they would use against like whatever my opponent may be, like a short stout wrestler or maybe a guy who comes out swinging. So I do a lot of studying and even now I've gone back, like I've gone back to studying a lot more and I, I enjoy walking fights and actually just walking techniques and then trying them a lot more yeah danny we've talked about a lot about like um about fight iq which is basically that's what our uh, aiden's talking about there like and having a strategy to combat certain fighters i know that's something that you're very big on but also i've you know whenever we've had any of your fighters on they speak highly of your ability to find uh you know a different strategy for different types of fighters and stuff like that like that is a vital part of uh, fighting isn't it and it's not just a case of turning up doing your fight camp and you know going in there and hoping for the best you've got to have a an approach for each individual fighter yeah and as we spoke over the course of time of doing the podcast with different fighters it's amazing now different that they have their approach in terms of their mental preparation i mean obviously there's a physical aspect that we all have to get ready for competition and um, that has to be put in place but some of them don't like to strategize they're just like hey look yeah. i feel pretty proficient everywhere and they're just instinctual fighters i suppose that's sort of like how i see them they're just instinctual they just play the fight out as it happens they don't like to strategize they don't like being limited to one train of thought they just want to go in there throw down if it's not going their way they'll clinch um they, they just don't work that way um which is absolutely fine it seems that like, aiden you're, you're very similar to how i like to think that i am it has always been which is to see who and what i'm up against try and work against their skill sets and yeah. maybe have something put into my game um that might be a surprise on the night and so on and so forth but yeah there are fighters out there that they're just training all aspects of the areas like they should they, they go in there the fit well prepared but they don't like to have a game plan they 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 just go in there and just instinctually take the fight um, on the matter minute by minute. And, and that amazes me because I would always want to have something in my mind, a little bit of a game plan on what I want to do. Am I going to kick this guy's legs? And am I going to stay rangy, jab and move and yeah. so on and so forth? But each so is their say, own, I suppose. As you're saying this now, actually, like um, uh, I feel like if you ask me this question in five years, I might give you a different answer of like, how I approach it. But So I used to be really like, like, I study my opponents a bit too much. Like, I mean, uh, my missus will mad, but like, every night, and every morning, and every lunch, and every in between every session, I'd probably be searching on YouTube, watching the fight again and again, slow more and clips down, seeing what they did. Like, to the point where it was getting steamed, but especially like, the last two pro fights, or not the one before, but like, the like uh, Jalal fight and Cameron fight, it was getting like crazy. But like, my coach, Chris, said, like, this time, find it down a little bit. You have a little watch, a little study, and then you go a little bit more into the instinctual side of what you've just mentioned there, Danny, with um, more just feeling how the fight goes. Only because, like, like I said, if you want to get bad insomnia, so, like, I like wouldn't sleep for the weeks yeah. of the fight. I mean, like, I'd be crying in the morning. Like, I, I, so, so I don't fight. Nothing makes me upset. That's so bad. But nothing makes me upset. Except for Monday morning training or Tuesday, and I haven't slept, like, for, like a day and a half, and I just got rinsed by all the boys, and someone's trying to knock me out in, like, four weeks' time. That's your thing with the emotional life. But um yeah, so I tried widening it down for ham to fight of just not studying so much of the sport of the opponent. Like I mean, just letting my own skill set do the job for me. And um I did feel a lot more relaxed, especially after the fight, like I was didn't I slept a lot better than, than usual and um I weren't so like really twitchy to all the guys move. Like sometimes if you watch a guy too much I was getting to a point where like so say you're fighting a guy with a real good head kick, you can almost overthink that head kick. So when yeah. the camp out fight, like I knew he could knock me out. And I knew he could knock me out. Well that's how he wins, he's knocking boys out. And I was this four old superstar or prospect and sort of stuff I was getting told me or this. I was like rank number like fourteen to the UK after four fights. And next thing I'm watching this guy and I'm like, 
the week of the fight, the press were filled. I did an interview like the night before, I think, on the night before, but um, yeah, I was uh, I was just feeling like, oh my god, like the night before, I was like, even not more than 60 seconds, like, mm. even not in under a minute, I could not stop thinking about it. And I didn't, I woke Chris up at 2 a.m. So if you ever had this Danny, one of your own fighters waking you up, I was like, Chris, mm. Chris, yeah, you what? Like, I don't want to fight tomorrow. I just don't want to do it. Like, because nah. like, oh, like, he knows me, so that's trying to calm me down. He's like, "What's my?" I was, I just, I don't know. I, just, I don't feel like I want to do this anymore. Like, I, I, I never felt like that in my life. I love fighting and I love the sport, but I was in bed. I it was two a.m. and I was just like spiraling anxiety. I was like, I don't want to do this tomorrow. But again, mm. I really just focused so much on like the, the power of his punches and the pressure of the moment that I just get. I mean, I, I just didn't, I didn't do me. So I'm trying to yeah. like, set back the road to me ramming on kind of bad fish. But like I'm trying mm-hmm. to see about the mission instinct of stuff that the end right now I'm trying to find a happy medium. Because I enjoy watching fights again and I enjoy watching techniques and trying them out and then like making sure I'm just working on myself and my own skill set. It's yeah. um, um, go on Dan. Yeah, that's right. It's really interesting, you know, you saying that. Um I mean everyone deals with fights in terms of their anxieties and we've, we've all got to have some form of anxieties otherwise there's got to be something wrong with you you know you, yeah. you, you don't fit into the normal stereotype of the emotions involved with knowing you're going to be competing against someone but for me I used to always get my dread as soon as I got the phone call saying hey you've been offered this guy you know what yeah, do you think yeah. you're going to go yeah. as soon as I said yes to it I used to find it was really on my mind and almost to a point where I was depressed that I had to prepare for the guy. Yes. Um, yeah. And then as I started to prepare, suddenly I'd start slowly getting into automatic pilot and it would seem more job-like and and I'd get more confident that I could yeah. put things in place to make the guy not so effective. I mean, I fought some guys that really did scare me. One of, one of the guys that I was most fearful of fighting was a guy called Tom Nimanaki. You know, uh, this guy was a black belt on the ground and he could wrestle some and he was a world kickboxing champion that was TKOing, KOing, leg kicking right. the crap yeah. out of people um, and he had come all the way down to featherweight from welterweight. He had fought proficiently at felt welterweight, come down to lightweight, then wanted to change. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And um, yeah, it made me maybe quite, quite fearful but the, 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 this is just the way it worked for me. Um, I just found as I started to prepare my training to make his skill sets less effective and my skill sets more effective, I started to feel more confident in my game plan and that yeah. there is always a way to win. And really, that's what I'm trying to instill into my students is that, look, if you've got two arms, two legs and a, and a head and, and yeah. you intelligently approach fights, even a good game plan, a good strategy, you can beat someone who's technically better than you in all areas if you put yeah. the game together in a correct way. So that way you should be going in with that little bit of confidence. Um, about a little bit of fear as well. I think it's a balance. Yeah. The whole fear thing is, is a balance. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah. you know, when you talk about analysing your fight, yeah, you can absolutely overanalyse with, without a doubt. I think when you're looking at a fighter that you're going to be fighting up against, you should be looking at what he does and does effectively and how do you negate that. And then you try to get your own game off. And I think, yeah. you know, that's a simplified form of it, but you can dive in too heavy sometimes and get yourself stressed out. Um, sometimes you've just got to get in and go. It's like when you teach a kid to ride a bike. Um, you know, you well, teach them how to pedal a bike, but yeah. they're going to fall off from time to time and yeah. you've just got to let that be, but they will become good on the bike eventually. Yeah, I always and find that once I saw, sorry, I didn't. Yeah, go on. I say when I step in, I like once I walk out, my nerves are gone. Like I, I always know this well. My own time, like look, once I get going, I'm gonna be happy. Like I'm gonna be good. So mm-hmm. I, I just, like, just, like that kid in the first fight. I like that now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm hey, curious yeah. to know as well, Aiden. Um, yeah, sorry, keep jumping in on you here. Sorry, I'm, I'm just I'm curious. Right, to I'm just... Know, I'm, I almost created like a routine for myself. From from almost the night before the fight, uh, I would just yeah. almost have a routine. I'd go to bed around about the same sort of time, sleep. I'd wake up, always had a uh, had a bath at a certain time. I had almost like a ritual routine that slowly developed. Not never was ever planned, just but I just noticed it. I fell into a pattern. Yeah, I fell yeah. into a certain pattern that would lead up and um, and indeed even my warm up before yeah, I went out I, was a ritualistic. So do you have the same? That. So like mm-hmm. I um, I read a lot of like sports psychology books and stuff and the, um I was doing this like you said naturally without planning it it just started happening it's just from competing more the more you fight and compete the better you are doing it and mm-hmm. it was showing the, like the effects of just trying to keep stuff as similar and routine as you as, as possible without making it too rigid where if something went wrong it it mess you up it can help with performance and I was really like I was doing it naturally anyway like I was doing the same things like pretty much do the same thing like for 
go out, get my like do my bits, wake up, same type of warm up, get into it. Like I, I when I woke now, I feel like yeah, like I'm feeling like I'm in the fight mode. I'm just transforming that character. You know what I mean? To go out, yeah. Compete. Um, I always end up sitting on the toilet in between, like before I go out. I don't even. I just sit on there and I just read quotes on my phone. I always do it. Like I don't. I just. just it's a little quiet cube go out the way. There's no other fighters mm. facing the train room. Not seeing someone just being lost or covered in blood if someone screams with one. Just sitting a little bit and I have five minutes myself out, out the way of everyone. And then, like, usually for me, when I go from that moment back, it's game time. Like, I'd I be warmed up a bit, go, then I'll come back and I'm like, right, I'm done now. Like, it's, let's, let's, get, let's get out there, let's go. Mm. Aidan, you mentioned um, before the show, and you've mentioned it a couple of times in the show, that you suffer from, like, um, insomnia and i just wondered if that can have uh, i know like you've obviously just talked about like pre-fight anxiety and stuff like that but like if you do get really bad in insomnia in fact that does interest me because i get it my, i got it myself yeah. like literally last night i was up till about five and got up at like it's six exactly o'clock like it just cool. couldn't sleep at yeah. all yeah. and it's brutal like it, it, it like me just trying to deal with like my day i had to do a bit of editing and some stuff like nothing too heavy but i just had a bit to do today and i struggled all day because my head yeah. was fried like if you're doing that if you're not sleeping it's not allowing your body to to re recover and recuperate yeah. to go into a fight camp or to go into a fight or just you know to train every day like how hard is that to navigate and is this something which is, again, I guess is an ongoing problem, or is it just yeah. something which rears his head like now and again? No, it comes like it's 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 like I I think it's stress related for me. So like I get stressed with like I just, I'm straight up like if anyone asks me, I'm not gonna pretend to be like the super hard macho. Like I'm not. It, it's nerve wracking. It's fucking terrifying. Mm. But um, like the the biggest issue I find with insomnia, besides like the not sleeping, is the when I'm not recovering, which is never. I mean, that's never a good thing. Like I'm going to train a little bit more fatigued than I should be, but also like uh, this is that people forget. Like I don't know if you noticed today, but if you have an informed like you notice that your food choices won't be as good, or you'll want to eat more sugary yeah. platform snacks. Like that's like a, um, lots of coffee. Yeah. So like when I'm cutting weight and I got a fight coming up, and I haven't slept like a day, maybe have like, two, three nights of real bad sleep. Like I'm already cutting weight anyway, dieting, and then I'm like. My body just eat shit. This is the truth. Like you want to be sugar fat mm -hmm. bomb. I mean, it's, it's, uh, mm. it's part of your brain. You want to get like easy, quick food and calories and recharge up. You don't want to go and eat chicken rice and have all your salad and then you don't want to go and do your sprints. You don't want to go and do your, your ten grappling on whatever you got to do. Um, so it's going through that. Uh, but what I tend to do is like I train all year round. So I, I never, I don't take time off unless I have to. Like obviously, when I put my hand out and take a bit of forced rest. Where, where I could anyway, like I'd still run mm. what I do. So, like, Chris will, like, I've turned up to the gym before, and he's just gone, no, you're going home. He goes, go home, you're not trained today, go home. And I'm, I'm like, I'm a bit here, I'm a bit fuming, and like, here, and like, no, no, I've got to fight coming up to the week, I need to get these rounds in. He's like, no, you don't need to get these rounds in, you don't need to risk injury, you're not sparring, you're not, you're going home. Or, so like, I'll have that, and then Ash gives me another, Ash gives me another idea for the sort of thing. So Ash will be like, all right, you need to still do your rounds because obviously, like as a fighter, you'll like you do not want to skip a session. You don't want to skip a warm up. You don't want to skip a, a yeah. Beat. So um, he's like, I'm going to go and do these rounds, but you you go not expect to be a Ferrari today. So you can't go in expecting uh, a few performance. You've got to go in understanding you're going to be performing down here. So you've got to play to perform down here. Um, and that's a new thing you work on. It's helped me a lot more. So like. Like especially my last fight camp again, I'd have a day, we're doing times and going sessions and I'm fatigued and wrecked, but I haven't slept and recovered, and I'm expecting to just rinse everybody that I would usually beat because that's the way it is. This guys in gyms you, you beat quite comfy, and I, I, I I'm not doing it as well as I want to do it better. Mm. But before I get really emotional about it, I'm like freaking out. I just sit in the back and go, oh my god, if so and so did this to me, then hands are he's going to have his way. He's going to knock me out. He's gonna, but now I don't like. I understand like I can't go in expecting to perform like a Ferrari. Do you know what I mean if I'm not going in being like a Ferrari? So yeah, I'm, I use that a lot more now. But again, like this, I think this being said before, it takes confidence to have rest. So there are days when maybe I come to the gym, I am really fatigued. I've done a lot of sessions. My body's not covered. I have the day off. Um, before I couldn't do that. This is something like uh, like probably from like when I was younger with Brett. Like he would never take a day off. Like that. Like, 
it's probably like an hour. Like, obviously, don't train much now, but again, like you probably got an hour. Like you will never take a day off. You have to force him. It's quite like it's just seeing that like that mindset was ingrained in me. So now, like, I'm like, no, it's okay. Go home. One set missing one session is doesn't mean you're gonna lose a fight. Mm-hmm. So I use yeah. that a lot more. Sounds like that's um, also it's good that you you've got people you can trust as well who are you know they're not just like train 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 they've yeah. got your best interests at heart like so if they can see that you're you know you haven't slept or you're not in the best shape it's not just a case of business as usual they're doing what's best for you and you as a person and a fighter then you know psychologically that you can trust them so yeah. what that does is in the long term like in six six months later, when they're advising you about a strategy or a fight, or they're saying do this, you know, hundred percent, you can trust yeah. them, and it's it's got a, a knock on effect, I suppose, isn't it? Yeah. Long term, like, um, look, um, last year I just wanted to touch on um, it was you haven't fought now. Uh, was it September last year? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Coming up to well, the mid April. What's uh, what's any news on like a next fight for you? So I'm I'm literally trying to book one now. So I'm I'm training like I'm in fight camp. I'm preparing like I want to fight June. So like I know there's a card in June. I'm on to brave. I'm on to my manager. And I'm on to brave to get that fight in June. But they this I haven't come back with anything right now. Or they're just slow sorting things out. It's really frustrating for me as a as a fighter. But I'm just gonna prepare anyway because like they offered me um they offered they offered me a fight. Uh, for March, but it was like uh, February, like 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 the last week of February. So it was like three weeks away, or three and a half weeks away. And right. I wasn't, I prepared my weight wasn't as good. But again, a guy who was like, again, I've had six full fights. Just a guy who's fifteen and eight. I was like, oh, fuck's sake! Like I was like, mm. like, I said to Chris and Bray, I was like, if you just could have given me, if you could have said like, we will put you on in in March, be ready for it. Then we've been a bit more ready. But like when I found out the shows were delayed, I got a lot of training partners. And then they offered me a guy with 20 or 23 pro fights. And yeah. I was like, well, look, I'm not prepared. So like, after the last two fights, my gym, like, I've always taken on anybody and everyone. So they, they try to say, like, you can't just go scrap and everyone like this. If you don't perform the best, you need to be prepared in the pandemic. So I'm just prepared for June now. So if they do get offered someone like that, I don't know, for three, four weeks notice, I'll be a lot more prepared for that situation. Yeah. I think um, that's good. And obviously we found out just before Danny came in, before the show, that uh, you once upon a time, you got offered one of Danny's fighters, which uh, that was quite interesting to find. So tell yeah. us the story behind that, mate. I was, I was just sitting in Costa. I think I just fought, um, I think I just fought Luke Westwood. And then I was offered Jordan Bushenik. And they were like, they were like, do you want to fight Jordan on Saturday? And I was like, I can't fight in um, Kingsley Crawford. Yeah. And, uh, uh, so I was like, but I, I, I walked after that day, because I don't really hear his name, but I said, like, I walked everybody, so I walked him, I was like, oh, this fucking kid. But he actually reminded me a lot of his style, was very similar to my training partner at the time, Scott Pedersen. So I think, like, yeah. oh, he's Scotty, and um, I've watched him, I've watched all of his fights. So then um, he fought, I watched, uh, he fought Panic or Schuster. So um, I got, I think, no, I think I was speaking to a promoter, and he said, oh, look, Panic or said no to me. He might know obviously the promoter said to me not to fight me. I think the other time I was like I'd rather a put about but they can see he had a good grappling base and he's a striker and he's like this fucking shit up my tie guy. So I mm. think he was thinking he didn't want to fight a guy on his pro debut. So I, that was not as I had one pro fight and I couldn't get a fight. So they offered me panic off right and I think or panic or said no. But then I ended up seeing him fighting Jordan and then Jordan triangled him and then Jordan fought Shao Buster and as Shao was just like a guy like, oh, fuck, this guy's legit. I've, seen, I've been on a bunch of I've been after him to show he's fought on my teammates. He fought in the Iron Mask, so I know he's good. And then Jordan beat him, and so I was like, oh, fuck, I'm going to break the Jordan did. And then, like, obviously he's a different weight class, but I just, like, I've watched his career since, and, like, he's really sharp. And then um, I watched his fight against Paul Hughes, and I was like, ah, oh, this, this guy's class. Like, so I mean, I followed each other and told me he doesn't have any like me for stuff. But um, I seen that he was doing some rounds in um, BLS MMA. I've been, uh, which is funny, so I was saying my position course, my year trains there. I was going to go up there and do some wrestling and grappling on the shoes. So I like chatting then because I got a lot of respect for him and his, uh, his style of fighting. Like, I like, I like, and I like what he's about. Like, he seems like a good kid on interviews and like the way he conducts himself and just like hard working lad. So, again, yeah, I got offered Jordan 
back then. Small world, you know, the fight world. Yeah. But, um, yeah, that, that, that takes us quite nicely, Danny, into who's joining us next week, mate? Uh, Jordan. There we nice. Go. Uh, there we <laughs> go. Yeah, uh, his fight against that, uh, who we see, like, that was, me and the boys were watching that. And it was, Legendary. Like, I, had, like, I had that fucking, do you like that UFC main event fight? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I had that fight just sitting there. I was like, well, we're just two UK pros. Why do I feel like yeah. it's to be the boys watching it? Mm-hmm. And then they all squared. Like, well, like, I was like, that was a high level fight. And then, um, obviously, he just looked like it against Sherry Yo. I don't say his name, but Morgan. Sherry Yo. Yeah. 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 Like, that, that featherweight division in Cage was brilliant. It's quite mad, isn't it? Probably the best in the UK at the minute. Yeah, no, none like, of them would be at a place in UFC. I'll say that no. top five featherweights. No. no. I don't. Sherry A annoyed me a bit by the way he behaved after the after Jordan's fight. Like, I know like that he's got a big following and stuff, so it's probably not intelligent for me to criticize him. Like, I just didn't like the fact that he was a bit didn't want to shake hands and oh. like because Jordan like Jordan beat him clearly, and I just felt like it was a bit I don't know perpetual like maybe, but you know. It's what it is. No one likes losing, especially when you're a, you're a champion who's got a lot of hype behind them, and you get beat oh, by course. someone. You know, Jordan Dan is still relatively inexperienced, isn't he? Like he's only got um, <clears throat> a small number of pro fights, really. But um, yeah. if he doesn't bring the belt with him next uh, next Sunday, though, he's not coming on. Oh, no, trust me, he brings it to every bloody training session. Good. Uh, That's what I would do. Yeah, I'd, be, uh, I'd take it every day. Take it everywhere. He's old, holding up his trousers with that bloody belt, honestly. No, it's a <laughs> like, he, he deserves it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, no, he's, he's loving it. Him, mate. I, um, I also, so we'll, we'll move on to talking some news and stuff now before we go on to the fights and stuff from last weekend or this weekend. Um, but one of the things which caught my eye on social media, Paddy Daniel, uh, his first round of um, tests with the UFC. Which was I thought was quite quick from when they announced him signing yeah. to doing those tests. They're going to stick him in a fight real soon, yeah. I think. Um, yeah, Aiden, yeah. How do you how do you think he'll do, uh, Paddy Pimlet, Med? Who me or uh, yeah, Danny, uh, you? Uh, yeah, and no, Andy, go on. You, uh, uh, Aiden, sorry. Uh, how do you think Andy. Paddy will do? <laughs> I know Andy, I think, sorry, I, Med. I, I think he'll do good. Like, um, uh, so years ago, I went. I was like, oh, I don't know if he's good because he was bent with UFC when really. he was like, oh, I don't yeah, know if he's well. Like, he had some holes in his game. But, like, eh, like I think he's changed. His, I think his outside situation might have changed a bit more. Like, it's like what he does is what who Paddy is. I think he's, you, you forget, like, 21 years old being a K. George World Champion is young. Gotcha. It's just it's just a lot. Like, you, like 21 year old kids, like, for a lot of people, like, Again, I just I live in I, I only do this, but for a lot of people they got lives outside or they they, they, they still have all that stuff going on. So like you see him like he were in the best shape, maybe he's still growing, um, doing whatever. Now like you look at him, he looks like a legit athlete. He looks like a world champion. He looks like someone who could do well. So I think like he'll go to UFC and I think he we we will um perform and I think he's got great presence. His ability he doesn't really carry it himself. And when you yeah. fight Paddy, he's got that, that thing of um it's like you're fighting bigger than Paddy sometimes. Yeah. I think they get overwhelmed by that when they fight him. Yeah, I agree with that. I think um, the difference between him now and when he was the featherweight champ is one, I think his striking's better, his all round game is better. He yeah. hasn't got any. Like I, now I look at him and I don't feel like he's got any holes in his game. But also, um, like he's told us, Dan, didn't he? Like his, his life outside the cage is settled. He's got a house with yeah. his missus. Um, he's got rid of the the kind of hangers on and people who were just telling him what he wanted to hear and you know basically had their hands out and then when things went a bit tits up and he lost the fight and lost the belt they, they kind of all disappeared like um, yeah. but like yeah it'd be interesting I'm really looking forward to seeing how he goes but Danny like just lastly on Paddy like the um, the thing is when people say he grew up in cage warriors it almost seems like a bit of a cliche like you're just saying he's been there a few years but no. like he literally grew up in cage warriors yeah. he was there when he was 18 and if you look at the first photo of him he put it up on social media that first photo of him his first ever cage warriors fight is like he is a kid like he's he not a legit. man yeah. he's a kid like legitimately and like i think there's there's something to be said for just the amount of respect he deserves because when he you know he had that featherweight title when he was young 
and when he lost it, he had some injuries, and you know things didn't go well for him. For not necessarily with losses, but things weren't going as well for him, and that's yeah. difficult to deal with as a young athlete, isn't it? Dan. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, Sorry. Yeah, I think I think he's, you know, this kid's been through a hell of a lot. You're, you're right; he came into it ever so young, uh, um, you know, a really good level. Being it was Cage Warriors to me, Cage Warriors is, is world class. There's no, no two questions about it. And to be in it so young, and with that personality that he had as well, which can come across, um, it can come across negative in many people's minds. And indeed, when he was younger, I think that perhaps was the case. But now he's matured. I don't see it as cocky anymore. I see this guy as completely confident. He totally and utterly believes in everything that he says that he's going to do. Um, I think he knows he's something special. Yeah. Personally, you know, if I'm going to be critical and, and I kind of have to be forced into a corner to be critical because I'm so impressed with many, many aspects of, of his personality and um, his, his training ethic and his skill sets, um, I still want to see how he's going to be when he's put under pressure with the striking. And, and can't get the guy down to the ground, you know, and he's got, he's going to have to strike, you know. Yeah. At the minute we've seen him strike and get the clinch and get the takedown, he's been able to steer it in the direction that he's needed to to get the win. And um, it's more going to be a case of when he can't just send it to the area where he needs to be, then what's he going to be like when he's on the receiving end of a little bit of pressure? Because mm. that last fight that we saw, it was really, really impressive. And you've only ever got what you've got in front of you. But we really can take away anything regards of what he had to offer when someone's putting it on him. And um, UFC is definitely going to be where we're going to find that out. But uh, I have utmost confidence that he'll be finding his way and finding the right way very, very quickly in UFC. Yeah, I agree. Um so, on the subject, I suppose, of, uh, of confident fighters, UFC 264 sold out in seconds, uh, which is obviously going to be Conor McGregor versus Dustin Poirier, uh, the trilogy fight. It's going to be a real interesting fight. I, uh, I'm surprised that this is the route that both fighters went now. Because I felt like Poirier deserved that title shot, um, yeah. and he would have. I think he would have got it as well if he had not taken this fight. And I also feel like this is quite a risky fight for Conor McGregor because if Poirier starches him again, as he lost a bit of value, yes, he'll still be the big fight. But ultimately, it will do him a bit of harm. Um, Dan, do you think? Yeah, but I just think with regards to Conor McGregor, look, he's rich. Um, so he's not having to do it for financial means. He would love to add to his legacy because he's, he's a legend in the sport, however you look at it, what, no matter yeah. what was happened in his recent years. He's done some amazing things for the sport. He really, really has. Um, I just think there's some other real monsters out there that he could be matched up against because he's been quite versatile in regards to the weight that he's willing to fight at. But um, he has beat Poirier once. I, I, although he underperformed, in a lot of people's minds against Poirier last time out. There were um, signs there, wasn't there? That yeah, there were signs that he different. could be good. I just think that he keeps dipping his foot in and out of MMA. And MMA is of such a level now that you just can't do that and think you're going to be successful in the highest order. He ain't going to get no breaks. He ain't going to get no pushover fights. He, he's, he's going to have to fight some real dudes every single time he steps in. And... And, and so for, for, for that fact, you know, I'm, I'm glad he's fighting Poirier again. I think it'd be good. It'll still be highly watched. But you've got to think, why does Poirier want to take this fight? And I can't help but think to myself that Poirier is picking this fight because I think it's going to ferment him um, uh, financially. So that yeah. regardless of what happens when he does get that title shot, because at some point he probably is, if he loses it, I think he can retire quite happily. Um, I just think he's setting himself up financially with this fight. I think yeah. There's nothing more than that for him. The, financially, the Conor McGregor fight is more, you know, it's going to be better for him than taking the title yeah. fight. Um, and also, if he loses to Conor McGregor in the trilogy fight, he'll still probably get the title shot. Unless, yeah. Conor, unless, unless Conor McGregor decides he wants to go for it. And I'm not entirely... I say I'm not entirely sure I think he'll go for it. He has said recently that he would like to be the first three-week champion. Hmm. And let's face yeah. it, he does enjoy being the first person to do stuff. Um, 
just very quickly, um, Aidan, how do you see that fight going between McGregor yeah. and uh, Poirier? I, it's, it's hard. Like, I'm a mass, I'm a super McGregor fan, but I'm also a big Poirier fan. Like, I love them both. So, like as a fan, I, 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 I don't even, I don't even want to watch the fight again. I hate to see him get knocked out last time. But then, yeah. Um, I, the only thing for me, I seen a, a statistic, and it was like um, Poirier's fight time over since they first fight versus McGregor's fight time since they first fight. And the number difference was ridiculous. Like, and uh, even if you just went over the last two years alone, like four is five times just two in the last last twenty four months, and McGregor fighting last twenty four months again, it's ridiculously different number. And um, it, I think it does matter. And even this last fight, he got in there, and you could just see just like straight off the bat, and McGregor's quite a fast starter. He always has been, but he's always been active. McGregor's always been super active as a fighter. Like if you look at all yeah. the way he up in the UFC and through cage wise, he was an active guy. So um, and I think being active, your timings are better. Your your, your intuitions are a little bit better. You just these extra like these spider senses you have as fighters. They they are just on, and always seem to just have them. Plus all these things that you're sticking in. Uh, so prediction for me, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go. Uh, I would go with Gregor KO. I, I can't go against him. Can't go against him, yeah. So well, <laughs> I did see um, a thing with John Kavanagh, and he said, like, whereas over the last couple of years, McGregor is, has dipped his toe in a bit, you know, in and out. Like, he is apparently all in now. He's training full time, and he's. Is he doing skills, though? Because on Instagram, he's just doing conditioning. He's like, I yeah. am with a single trainer partner. Whereas Corey is always on that wall. Always on the mat. He's always doing wrestling rounds, wall wrestling rounds, boxing rounds. He's always doing skill based training. And you do think if McGregor was doing that stuff, it would be on his social media because and he puts you, everything on there. But if you go back to that old documentary years ago, McGregor was like, uh, I'm not going to try and do the acting on butcher it, but it's him with the RT documentary. And he's like, If you ask me to come in here and push a tyre, we'll do 10 rounds. You're going to do the 10 rounds every time. But mm. now we look. He's there pushing the tire twenty four seven, and he's not yeah. paying rounds every time. And I think yeah. that to me is a big sign. Yeah, I can. I yeah, can, I can yeah. What well, I totally agree. That's uh, you know a well spotted uh, view of how you've seen the differences in his preparations, and I think you're absolutely right. Uh, you've got to wonder, you know, when someone gets so wealthy and becomes so legendary in his status, whether they start to think that beyond just doing training with regular people mm -hmm. trying to strive to make yeah. their that their own successes in the sport. Um, yeah, I, I think it's so, so important to keep training with multiple training partners, even experimenting with different coaches and coaching. I think that's always a, a good thing and I always push that onto my students or at least give them freedom to go elsewhere to do their training yeah. as well. But yeah, you do wonder, you know, that's not going to really make him any better as a martial artist, is it? I, I do think his conditioning is an issue. He does gas. I think that's yes. to do with the fact that he's got really, really fast muscle uh, twitch fibers and he yes. just doesn't have the endurance type. I think that's just the way he is physically. Mm. Um, but yeah, I, I just think you can't beat training with bodies. Now, I had, or I have had issues because of what fighters have come out and said. And one of them was that Holloway said that he don't spar. And that's it. Some of the guys that are a little longer in the tooth that have been around a long time say, no, no, you know, I don't need to spar. I don't need to spar. And I'm like, look, that's a real oddity. And I bet you the truth is he probably does spar. Yeah, but he probably, he he, he's probably just not sparring the full aspect of MMA uh, yeah. with MMA gloves on. He's probably doing striking, just wrestling, just grappling, just tweaking a few ideas. He's reached that level where you can get away with doing that. But that's yeah. quite an oddity. And you do get your oddities. Um, you get your standouts, yeah. and I think Holloway's just one of those. But my goodness, sometimes like it's a nightmare for us coaches when someone says something like that. Suddenly, everyone thinks the answer is never to spar again, uh, no. and uh, it's not the case. That's not my problem. I love sparring. I spar. I spar. I spar. No, we're dead. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> um, okay, so let's quickly talk about it. Uh, last night we saw. Jake Paul versus Ben Askren. Danny, we oh. talked about this for the last few weeks. We, we were praying that Ben Askren was going to do the combat sports world a favour and just finish this YouTube boxing thing. Um, but just before we talk about that fight, um, I saw that uh, one of the uh, very trusted reporters said that uh, last night, uh, Jake Paul versus Ben Askren, Google Trends, so like the amount of people who search it on various 
Google platforms was 5.2 million, right? Mm -hmm. So to put that into perspective, last weekend was WrestleMania, which is obviously with WWE, one of the biggest companies in the world, over two nights, only did 750,000. So that kind of puts into perspective how much attention Jake Paul and Logan Paul do bring to boxing and, and these things. Like, you can't... You can't argue with the numbers, and look, I could sit here all night and tell you how absolute utter dog shit I thought the commentary was. The I just thought yeah. it was cringeworthy. I found it almost unwatchable. Luckily, I only watched eleven minutes of it this morning and watched the main event fight. I didn't watch the Frank Muir fight. Frank Muir lost to Steve Cunningham. Um, I didn't have enough interest to watch it all, but the commentary was just horrendous. Um, it is what it is, though. Maybe I'm just old, but I don't know. But in terms of the fight, look, a lot of people said it's a fix. And I saw someone someone put a clip of uh, Ben Askren. He was at, I can't remember who it was against, but he had basically had a UFC fighter on top of him, repeatedly elbowing him in, elbowing him in the head, and that didn't finish the fight. And then he went down to this one punch, which wasn't... It was a good punch, but it wasn't, like, anything compared to multiple elbows with someone on top of you. Yeah, that finished the fight. However, what I would say about that is that really wasn't up to Ben Askren, the fight finishing. Like, he got to his feet. He did, you know, It's not like he stayed down off that punch. He got to his feet. He answered the count. He answered the referee. He spoke to the referee. The referee decided that it was over. So if, it, if it's a fix... I'm not sure you can point to Ben Askren as it being the reason. It would be more the referee. And look, yeah. there was the first image you see of Ben Askren after the fight is him with his missus laughing. So I, I get like you know that's I, that's an issue I suppose. But um, yeah, Jake Paul won via knockout. Uh, the referee stopped it because Ben Askren was stumbling around the place. Is what the referee said. He wasn't stumbling around the place. Um, Aid, we'll go to you first as the young man on the panel. Uh, what did you make of what you saw of the event and also the fight yourself? Um, so similar to you, I didn't watch much. I watched a little bit of the first fight, boxing fight, and then I turned off that we were about a minute and a half in to seem ridiculous. Then um, uh, I, I didn't get the call the team at first. Like, so I, I thought, like I said to you earlier, I thought that Snoop Casting didn't contend the series where they had like yeah, like an alternative commentary booth where they got drunk. Then they found the last last legit commentary booth. I was like, oh right, this is a proper spectacle beer. Like it, it actually felt like a YouTuber event. It was yeah. a YouTuber event, but it felt like a YouTuber event. Like if a YouTuber event did a Boston show, that's mm. what it was. Um, and uh, the fight itself, um, uh, I was debating with the guys in the gym this morning about whether uh, he took a dive. I think it was a solid shot. Like. I watched it. Yeah, it like, was a good if, shot. To be fair, if 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 he acted that out, he's a much better actor than Aljamain Sterling. Because I hit him hard. Like he went like, yeah. over on his response, landed on his head, his arms didn't go out. And again, like like from my, I speak to my my mate Marks about this. Um, when you're young, when you just like, you know, like the young spunk, whatever you want to call it, doing so, I mean, they just full of it, like. You have this type of thing inside you where, like, I don't say to be older yet, but there's a belief, especially with young guys. Like, I, I've never been, like, as boisterous with it myself, but there's, like, that end you just want to come to kill. You want to smash. Like, you see guys in the gym all the time. Like, my mate Marcus was talking to about it. He's that typical, like, he's, he's a confident young man, like. Um, mm. So, as much as Ben can go on his past experience and who he's fought and stuff, it don't matter who, you, like, like, who you've fought. When you are when you're fighting, it's just you and that person. You've got to respect them, and you've got if you've got to respect the young, hungry power. Like when a guy wants to come to hurt you, and like when you've had three fights, you're nervous. Thing that's his third, third, third pro fight. Yeah, you're I think third or fourth. Yeah. You're excited, and you 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 want to go and put. Like, you're gonna put a lot of your shots. You're gonna want to go and put the guy away. When you fought some of the biggest killers in the world, and you see this kid as a YouTube star, and you. I don't know if he didn't prepare for it, but when he came out and he was trying to clinch him and he just looked really like, I don't know if his pounds to try and weigh him down with some like clinch work and weigh on him. I just feel like that jab was again just too slow and he just comes through the top of the bank on top of the, top of the head. I just don't feel like that was a fit. 
Revolut was back to Victor, maybe, but not not from Asuka. And I just felt like he didn't. He just. I felt like he never was going to box or be a good yeah. boxer. Like Danny, we said the one thing which could undo Ben Askren was if he didn't take it seriously and he didn't prepare and like he didn't look in the best shape. He was slow and sluggish with his stru- the, the few strikes he did let off. He did. He tried to clinch up, like Aiden said. It wasn't particularly impressive, but yeah, I knew. I knew we was in media trouble. Train goes on. I knew he was in trouble or he was in trouble as soon as he come out and he held his guard with his elbows extended from his body. You know, he was, he, he was trying to put his hands up like that. It was yeah. ridiculous. His elbows was right out. He's putting his hands up to his head rather than his head, head down to his hands. And um, that, that, that just means that if hands are coming at you and they come in more than one, your chin's going to start coming up. You're going to have massive holes in your defense. Uh, I just knew he was going to be in trouble. And um, yeah, it was matter of time before he got knocked on his ass. I think it was an actually legit knockdown. Um, yes, the ref stopped it possibly too early, but I think he would have been knocked down again in the, probably the next yeah. round, to be honest, with that yeah. kind of defence. Clearly, I mean, we, look, Ben Astrid's no striker. But he has, obviously, he's not done no real training to try to no. rectify that. I think there's nothing more than a payday. Ben Askren don't take himself seriously. He jokes about no, himself all the time. I think this was a bit of fun for him, for which he got paid probably a stupid amount of money. And well, um, this was nothing more than a financial stunt for him. As a, but it <laughs> hasn't done that, us any good. Because no. Jake Paul's now going to... He's just creating more well, he attention fought. to himself. Here's the thing, Dan, right? Uh, First and foremost, Ben Askren would have got paid more for that fight last night, especially after the pay-per-view buys, than he earned in UFC and one combined. Yeah, yeah. So I don't fault him for taking it. Good for him for getting himself into a position. Because let's face it, his UFC career finished went badly, finished badly. So he yeah, wasn't yeah. exactly at the top of his uh, like fame game, if you like. So to get in that fight and get it and get paid, good for him. Can't fault him. Yeah. Um, in terms of Jake Paul, he still hasn't fought a boxer. He still hasn't fought someone who's a legitimate threat for me. Um, so until he does that, I find it difficult to really comment on his uh, his skills or his abilities as a fighter. But he did finish him with a good shot. Um, a few names that have come up that I want to put to you. Uh, Tommy Fury, Tyson Fury's younger brother, said he wants to fight Jake Paul. For me... Tommy Fury would absolutely destroy Jake Paul because Tommy yeah. Fury is a legitimate boxer. Um, the other one I saw and Aiden mentioned before the show was Artem Lobov. To me, the only reason that go that interests anyone or me and I think probably Jake Paul is Artem Lobov is a way to get to Conor McGregor, which is all you know. That's the fight you want. Let's face it, because that's the biggest fight you can have. Um, if he fights Artem Lobov and beats him and in the process upsets him with some offensive comment, less yeah. that pretty much, in my opinion, cements the fact that he'll fight Conor McGregor at some point. But there are a couple of the names. Um, I've seen a couple of other British boxers who've said you know they would happily have a crack. To me, it needs to be someone... For Jake Paul to take the fight, it's got to be someone relatively well-known. Which obviously I think Lo- Artem Lobov is well known because of his relationship with Connor. Tommy Fury is well known because of his, who his brother is, he's the heavyweight champion of the world. Um, which way do you see that going, Danny? Out of the age, like if you had, would you pick one of those two to fight Jake Paul, or would you pick someone else? Yeah, Just I don't think Jake Jake Paul wants boxer. to fight a, le- a legit season boxer of any note. I no. think he wants to fight. He wants to pull people that, wants that are alien fights. to that arena. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, that Lobov is tiny as well. He's not a very big, big guy. He'd be giving away a lot of natural yeah, weight. Small. Yeah, really, really small. Um, I mean, don't get me wrong. Lobov's a much better uh, uh, striker Stryker, overall, yeah. I would suggest. But he's giving away a lot of natural size. And when you've got big pillars on your hands um, compared to the MMA gloves, it's going to make him a little bit more ineffective as well. So I don't, I'm not even too sure how that would even go down because weight matters, especially yeah. with the striking. Um, I don't know where it's going to go. Um, you know, we, I'm not one of these people that obsess about it. I'm too interested in UFCs and, and yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. But for, for many, many other people that 
you know, the, the UFC is just something they watch as a pastime, would also equally like to watch the attention that Jake Paul brings to this unusual arena that he's creating for himself. Uh, um, combat sports, I love them all. And even in their freak forms such as this, it's something different. Yes, he's not necessarily yeah. the most likable person in the world, but I think he knows it. I think he plays off it, and it's just, just going to make his pockets even more bigger in terms of financial gain. And that's going to open him up to offer more money to more wider audience to pull in whoever else he wants to. Um, I don't know. Yeah, it, it, it is a craziness, but it's just it's just the way things are at the minute. And I don't think it's necessarily bad. If if look, if five million plus people are trying to get access to watch this, there's got to be something right about it for for yeah. regards audience. I don't know. Oh, I, well, I yeah, hate to think how many pay-per-view buys Conor McGregor versus one of the poor, poor brothers. Oh, it'd be record-breaking, no doubt. When you, um, one thing I always, I, I thought I spoke to people about this for years is um, when it comes to fighting, like I, I do myself. Sometimes you're watching a fight in the UFC and that, and you just, you just you're watching it, and, like you just can't be after. It. It's normal. It does happen. Like you watch a fight, you're not not feeling it as much. But when there's a fight with like a bit of emotion, a bit of tension, it just get it just gets your energy. It's like when school, when two guys are fighting in school, they couldn't fight for shit. Just the same with Jake Paul and whoever. They're not gonna that, they're not gonna fight for shit, they're gonna be terrible. But because they don't like each other and there's a bit of animosity there, there's like a like a storyline, you wanna watch it. And yeah. um I feel like it like anyone who doesn't want these YouTube fights to be around, they're gonna be sadly mistaken because they're gonna be around because you can yeah. create a storyline. You've got two well known people Mm. So all they have to do is start a beef with each other, which isn't hard. That's what we've done. They start these beefs, and people will tune in for a beef. If they act like best mates, they wouldn't tune in because, yeah. like Dustin Poirier and McGregor, where or, or when McGregor was all pally pally with Cerrone, they can do that because of the skill level we watch and we appreciate the art of what they can do and who they are, and we're already fans. But if you want to get guys to pay attention to something, just get them to be pissed off each other, and a lot of yeah. people, if they've got an audience, they will tune in. Oh yeah, hundred percent. And I think um, it'll be interesting, at least, to see where they go next. Um, can't you know? Look, Jake Paul and Logan Paul have made uh, millions and millions and millions of uh, dollars on being not liked. It's just the you know, and, and they they thrive on it. It is what it is. Yeah, I I just wish they would offer me that I would step in there and fight for the ridiculous yeah, amount of money they're getting offered. I mean, I could do with some money. Bring it my way. It. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I, could, right. I don't mind losing a few more teeth. Hundred <laughs> percent, I take it. Right, um, just to finish this off, then, mate. Uh, before a well, finish. Uh, Aiden's going to chip off now, so we're going to uh, get the predictions for next week's uh, UFC card. Uh, UFC two six one, and uh, it's a proper card of fights. Let me tell you, yeah. um, it is. Let's have a look. So we got. Uh, Let's start at the top and move our way uh, down, I think. But um, So, the main event, uh, Kamara, Kamara Usman versus Jorge Masvidal. Uh, Aiden, who have you got and why? I've got Usman. I think he's fucking incredible. Um, I trained in Sanford uh, for a week uh, when Brett was fighting in Miami. I, I, I think that gym's got some seriously good tough guys. I know he's just left there, but when you're both your training being done for somewhere... You do tend to like, keep a lot of them habits on you, so he, like I know he's trained a lot of good tough guys, just same as four eight. But he's also um, from his last few fights, he showed real good championship was all. his ability just to get through like um, a deal because blasting, rocking, and he like composed himself, came back and looked incredible. So I got Kamaru in that county. What about you, Dan? Yeah, uh, I've got to go, Usman. Really, I just. You know, if, obviously, it's massive that was going to win. It's because he's going to catch it with something like a jumping knee or one of those big, big overhand yeah. punches, and he tastes blood very, very quickly. But you know, Gilbert Burns can also be really explosive and, and taste blood, and he couldn't get the job done. And I just don't think Massive was going to get it done. I think he's obviously going to perform better than he did the first time around, being that he took it on such short notice and had such a hard weight cut for it. But yeah, I just think Usman's just too complete. I think he's just a, a, a difficult, difficult proposition for Masvidal to try and figure out to find a way yeah. to get to him. I think over five rounds, Usman's can play the patient game. I think Masvidal would suit more if it's three rounds. Yeah. But over five rounds, I think yeah. Usman will slowly start shutting him down technically and just suffocate his game. Um, I think Masvidal's got something to prove after the first fight, but ultimately, I think Usman will be too good. Um, yeah. 
but we'll see, I guess. Uh, then we've got the women's strawweight title match between uh, Shang Wei Li, the champion, versus Rose Nami Yunus. Uh, Danny, we'll go to you first. Who you got? Ah, this is such an interesting fight. And um, as a pure fan of martial arts, this is just such a great matchup. My heart high, would go for level. Rose. I, I really want Rose to win, but I, don't, I just I find it hard to bet against yeah. Wei Li. So, you know, putting money down, I'd go Wei Li. But like I say, with my heart, I want, would like to see Rose win and, and become super relevant again. But we'll see. I, I think Wei Li's got it, though. Wiley is an is an absolute animal. Uh, she yeah, is a, yeah. She is just a brutal fighter. And the problem with Wiley is not only is she highly highly skilled, but she could take a beat in as well. Uh, so yeah, absolutely. I my thing is the only uh, for me I think the only way Nama Yunus is going to be able to win is via points because I can't see her knocking her out and I can't see her finishing her. I can't see right. her submitting her. Yeah. Whereas Zhang Wiley, I can see stopping Rose so mm. I'm going to go with uh, Shang Kui Li uh, I'm a big fan of her work I've got to say um, what about you Aiden? Uh, same here uh, funny enough we all got the same manager all, me and Jack like, my managers Jay Lang Reed and uh, things manager so oh, wow. see, like, yeah I'm always posting with them and like what they do but as um, like a fan watching I think Zhang I can't say her name properly but Zhang Li will win um, I, after I like, my manager posted for a while ago, see, and like, it was, like she was like sent me an old thing. I was like, Oh, this girl's pretty good. She looks like a beast, but she's pretty good. But then, mm -hmm. as I watched the form, I feel like she's got that, that it thing. Mm. And I think Rose is quite, I love watching Rose since I'm a fighter, but I don't know if she's got that it factor. I feel like we, I feel like Jay Young has got that champion, that, that thing that champions have where they will just find a way to win. I just don't feel like, she yeah. knows, I feel like she doesn't know how to lose. Yeah, yeah, I, I still think that fight. Between Zhang Wiley and George, was it yeah. Jan Jay Check? Um, that was one of the best fights I've ever seen. Um, yeah. Male or male or female, and I just yeah, that that fight was historic. If she brings versus <laughs> yeah, <that's it. laughs> it, well, the thing is, if she brings that game to Rose or the way Rose has fought in her previous five fights or whatever, like I just can't see Rose stopping her, and then I just yeah. think. Will Rose then have enough to outpoint her throughout five rounds? I think it was yeah. five rounds. Um, then we got uh, a women's flyweight title match between Valentina Shevchenko and Jessica Andrade. Will somebody take the title off Valentina or will they not? Uh, Aiden, what do you think? Uh, I'm going to go Shevchenko. Um, I just feel like she won't get caught. Like, I don't think Andrade will be able to play the. Like void a game on it. I just don't think mm. she's gonna get hold of her and bully it. I just don't think that's gonna happen. I think if it was too slick, she's gonna move. I think it'll be a decision. I don't think it'll be. A I don't think it'll be a finish. I think it'll be a uh, decision. But I think she'll just outclass her. She'll just look like a dormant champion. Yeah, she's good in the grapple as well, then Shevchenko. But she's underrated yeah. in the grapple, I think. So, but uh, yeah, I think Shevchenko. What about you, Danny? Yeah, I'm going to go Shevchenko. I mean, Adrada's very, very good. I think yeah. she can push her in each and every range. But, I, I, and yeah, Shevchenko's just, she's just so impressive. Um, she has been pushed in her last two bouts, you know, definitely yeah. so. But she still always finds a way to get it done, and she always does it very, very impressively. So, yeah, going to go Shevchenko. Um, and then very quickly, we'll do Uriah Hall versus Chris Weidman. Uh, Aiden, who <sighs> so you got? Hard. Um, I, I want to go Weidman. I want to go Weidman. I want. I actually want him to win. I like yeah, him. He likes each other. Yeah. Like, I think he's winning. But the problem with Weidman, he's winning the fight until he's not. So he's yeah. battered a guy and then gets started. Yeah. And you and if you were going to fight the guy in the UFC, and that's the type of fighter you are, you don't want to fight your eye roll. He's the last. Yeah, he's so unpredictable, fight. isn't he? No. So I, I'm. I want to. I'm. I'm going to go Weidman. Though. I believe he, he. He gets past that, but otherwise, it's dead time. Yeah, two very unpredictable fighters for different reasons. Um, Danny, who you got? Yeah, this is really, really hard one to pick, uh, and and it, again, kind of my, my my sort of heart goes to Chris Weidman because I, I love what he did, you know, um, back years ago. Um, you know, he he was, you know, the first person to topple Anderson Silva, you know, proper, and um, but then kind of never never really lived up to. The expectations thereafter did he kind of 
yeah. fell off the cliff somewhat. But, you know, he's getting him back up into some kind of relevancy. I still don't think he's as good as he was. But a right horse, he starts slow, doesn't he, all the time? Mm-hmm. He starts slow. And maybe that gives Chris Wyman a chance to to sort of settle yeah. and keep his chin safe because it is all about I, I totally agree with Aiden uh, he's quite often winning up until he gets knocked out he seems to always go tits up somewhere down the line for him but right horse starts start slow so I'm banking on because he starts slow Chris Wyman can find his foot in find his feet well and try to just get to the finish line and um, I think he'll take the early rounds and just have to hold on I think he'll get roughed up though uh, but he has to stay out of trouble for that final round yeah spot on um, and then the final fight for us to talk about, Anthony Smith, Jimmy Crute. Um, obviously, Danny Jimmy beat Modestas uh, in his last fight. Anthony Smith um, needs a win. Well, who you got? Again, Jimmy Crute. I just, he's, uh, uh, yeah, re- I really, really highly rate this guy. So to me, he's in the top five yeah, in abilities as far as I'm concerned. And, and Anthony Smith's had a hard time of it of late. I still really, really rate him, don't get me wrong. Um, the, the the thing in and uh, Anthony Smith's favour is the fact that he's got quite a bit of height and, uh, height and reach uh, advantage. You know, he might be able to try and work that to his advantage at some point. But Jimmy Crute's so well rounded. He can strike, he can wrestle, and his jiu-jitsu is really, really good. I really rate his grappling game. So I just think Jimmy Crute's got more ways to win. Yeah, yeah, I I, yeah. I, I tend to agree with that. Aiden, are you the same there, or do you fancy Anthony Smith yeah, in that one? Yeah, exactly the same. To be honest, um, I like I do. I, I actually like Anthony Smith, and when me and the boys sit together, and we sometimes we're pulling like YouTube highlights of fighters, and we're sitting there just watching shit. Uh, he's one of my favorite highlight reels of anyone. Like he's he bored his boys, but I feel like Jimmy Coop is about. I feel like he's about to break into that. Like this is this this is why they've given him this fight. They want to try and introduce a young up and camera who's got yeah. all the ability in the world to a decently well-known name and if he can't pass this test then he's not going to be who he's going to be but I think he'll pass with flying colours and I think he'll generally be in the top 10 uh, to the tail end of the shoot yeah, yeah I agree I agree completely um, Aiden, thank you for joining us mate it's been an yeah, absolute yeah. pleasure I really enjoyed it oh, it was great guys I actually enjoyed a lot I, um, I'll come on again if you ever want me to come on after the fight or whatever it's good luck it's been. yeah 100% time. mate Welcome back anytime. You uh, have try and get some sleep now, yeah. buddy. And uh, <laughs> we'll let's speak to you soon. Keep in touch, though, mate. Yeah. Good yeah, talking yeah, to you, Adam. Early pads in the morning. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, guys. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers, buddy. Aiden James, another top guest for the Danny Batten Fight Show, mate. Really enjoyed that. Yes. It was a really interesting chat, and I like um, with these like guests and stuff. I do like that you get like a different insight into different things. And like, obviously, you don't hear a lot of fighters talk about the the anxiety before a fight, and I like mm-hmm. that. It was a good little insight into that. Yeah, that side I think of somebody it. somebody fighters don't want to admit to it. You know, there there yeah. is anxieties, and along with the anxiety is some fear. And I, I've never but you wouldn't be human, away. mate. You wouldn't be human yeah. if you didn't get that for me. Like, I, do you know what I mean? Yeah, I do. I do think there is people that don't have that fear. I mean, we know like these thrill seekers, they have a lot of inactivity in the part of the brain that would normally induce fear. So, you know, I do think there are some people out there that do compete that don't get affected by fear as much as us normal mortals. But um, I think for the most part, we do have fear. Um, yeah. and, and if it ain't a fear of your opponent, it's a fear of losing. Uh, no one really wants to lose, right? Um, no, of course not. Not if you're in it to win it if the fear is obviously that you could lose but that's the beauty of the sport as well you know if you're guaranteed to win there'd be no point doing it either yes yeah, spot on mate spot on but uh, let's talk some mma then mate um obviously well because we've covered so much tonight already we're going to fly through oh these. my god yeah we um, did but let's start with bellator from friday bellator 257 um it was quite an interesting card actually um some good fights you had uh, Paul Daly for obviously the Brit, uh, Corey Anderson for in the Grand Prix. Um, so it's Roy, Ryan Bader is going to take on Corey Anderson in the next round of the light heavyweight Grand Prix, which is, I find that uh, an interesting matchup. But uh, what did you make of Corey Anderson's performance? Yeah, really, really good. Really, really solid. Demonstrated some nice striking. Um, nice patience as well he didn't rush anything clinched up very well started to nail the takedowns as the rounds progressed and looked really really good when he had the dominant position throwing down those lethal looking elbows to get the stoppage yeah he's looking really really good since he's gone over to Bellator 
Um, I just don't think he's been coming up against this type of stiff competition that he was typically facing in UFC. So I think for that part, it seemed like an easy ride for him. But Bader, Bader's still very, very legit. And um, that's going to be a good matchup. I'll really be, be watching that fight with a lot of interest, to be honest. Yeah, 100%. Um, you had uh, Vadim ne Nemkov versus Phil Davis uh, in the other light heavyweight Grand Prix quarterfinal with uh, Nemkov picking up a unanimous decision victory. Um, I thought Nemkov looks pretty good in this one, I've got to be honest. Yeah, really enjoyed it. Phil Davis always struggles with his work rate. He looks clinically you know, pretty clean as a striker. He's got very, very good wrestling and, and can grapple some as well. He really is a well-rounded individual, but he is a, just a little bit of a plodder. Um, he does just does, does everything well apart from know where he's at in the fight. I don't know whether he knows he's slipping behind in the rounds. You would think his cornerman would tell him to try and pick up the pace. But he just couldn't run along with Nemkov. And Nemkov just took those early rounds. It did look like Nemkov was beginning to gas a little bit in round four and round five. Um, there was times he was having to take some deep breaths. And his pace seemed to slow up a little bit. And... Um, now, it, it looked like it could potentially have slipped away from him. But the thing that impressed me with Nemkov was that although he was predominantly winning this with his work rate in the striking, he was shooting mm. in towards a lot of one and a half minutes to one minute left of the round. He was actually shooting in with legit takedowns, um, which for which he did have successes with. And if it didn't create a success, he was pushing um, him up against the, uh, the cage just to just to consolidate the round, I suppose you would say. Um he really, really impressed me with the way he performed in each and every one of those rounds. Yes, indeed. Um, so we also had uh, Paul Semtex Daly defeated uh, Shabar Hamasi via TKO strikes. This was fascinating because, like, when you look at it, oh, Paul Daly wins via TKO strikes about a minute into the first, second round. But actually, uh, Hamasi did very well before he got knocked out. Absolutely. He come out all guns ablaze. He really, really did. I hated Hamas's kicking game. Every time he kicked at Paul Daly's legs, he was out of distance, would throw the kick as if it was going to land him. Obviously, it didn't. It made him off balance. It was horrible. But when he went in with the hands, he looked utterly devastating and nearly put Paul Daly away. Um, he, he, he put the, Paul Daly on his uh, on his ass. was really aggressively chasing after the ground and pound thereafter. And he had um, more than one occasion where he had Paul Daly yes. a little bit vulnerable. But Paul there Daly... At one point, he looked like he had him completely, yes, and I thought did. it was game it's, over. Yeah, just a little bit more, and I think the ref could have had grounds to step in and stop the fight. But Paul Daly was showing that he wanted to, to stay in it. He was trying to transition his positions from the floor to back to his feet. And Paul Daly just was showing his seasoned game, his, his experienced game. He was patient. He got his opportunity and really put it on Hamasi. And I don't know whether it's because Hamasi took something out of himself by trying to chase down uh, Paul Daly so early on. Mm. Maybe he was getting himself a little gas, but when he was on the receiving end, um, it looked more devastating what Paul Daly was doing. And he, Paul Daly got the win. But it was a great win. What can you say? Yeah. Well, be well yeah, done, Paul Daly. Win, yeah. I don't know what he's going to do with his career now. I don't know whether he's going to formally retire or whether he's going to keep going. Because the thing is, when you win, it makes you feel like you want to keep winning. And then when yes. you lose, you feel like you want to fight one more time to get the win. <laughs> it's just yeah, ongoing battle yeah, no, when you I try to look to retire. But he has been in it a long time. If he didn't fight anymore, you know, he's career. had a smashing career. If he does fight again, it's always got to be fireworks. Oh, yeah. It doesn't hold back. Um, the other fight on the main card was uh, the ladies. Uh, Vita, uh, Vita Ortega versus Desiree Yanis. Uh, I was pleased that to see a couple of, uh, f of three female fights on the card overall. Uh, Julia Budd won via decision uh, on the preview card, uh, prelims, and Julia Angelica has won as well. Um, Bellator haven't always featured the ladies that right. prominently, so to have three fights on the card overall, I thought was good. Uh, yeah. Vita in the main card, uh, Vita Ortega defeated Desiree uh, via a majority decision. Did you watch right. this one? No, 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 I didn't. Um, yeah, so it was a it was a good little fight, um, but I thought Vita won pretty comfortably. Um, for right. what I saw, I only saw the highlights of that one, but um, but ultimately good, uh, you know, enjoyable fight, uh, enjoyable card from Bellator, um, and it's good to see that these like the Bellator cards are back up and running properly now. Uh, yeah, and we're seeing the big fighters come out. You know, the big yeah, that's right. Yeah, we're actually seeing some good matchups. Uh, it was I, actually I enjoyable hope... to watch Bellator. Yeah, indeed. I hope they bring you know Lewis Long and and these guys back 
not what we obviously heard rumours over the last couple of weeks of Bellator yeah. getting rid of some of the European fighters. They got some real yeah. good talent there, and I, I hope Agreed. they use them rather than bin them. Um, which you know, they won't struggle to get fights and contracts elsewhere. But that's not the point. Um, right. And then we got the the UFC um, fight night from Vegas. Uh, every fight on the main card went to the judges. Uh, two fights on the prelims went to the judges. Uh, I thought there was one TKO, but I can't. It doesn't seem to be on my card. Um, oh, there. Sorry, uh, there was more prelims. Uh, so there was a couple of prelims fight. One Tony Gravely, uh, who obviously we watched fight Brett Johns, uh, finished Anthony Burchak via a TKO in round two. Um, and I've been told that was a really, really good finish. Right. Uh, so I might have a quick look at that one, actually. But, um, yeah, um, some familiar names on the prelims. Uh, Gerard Mershat beats Fabianski by a guillotine. Um, Tony Gravely obviously picked up a win. Um, but on the main card, mate, we started with uh, Luis Pena versus Alexander Munez. Went to a split decision with Luis Pena picking up the victory. Yeah, I was. I actually thought Munez won it. I thought yeah. Munez uh, picked up the first two rounds, and Pena obviously won that third round. But I, I, I don't know how they could give Pena that round. And um, Munez landed more significant strikes in those first two rounds, in each of the rounds, and also was nailing the takedowns. I really am bewildered on how it went in Pena's favour. I, I really, hmm. don't, I, I don't get it. And um, this is perhaps something that I'm going to be put into Paul Sutherland and see yeah, what he comes definitely. up with. Yeah, I'd be curious He'd to see. I don't know whether you agree. Explain it to us, mate. Yeah, I absolutely. Agree yeah, with you, mate. And, um, yeah, I was struggling. Yeah, but to see what it. a good point. So, I mean, Munoz was really impressive. Really, a Penner is a difficult customer, six foot three, super rangy, and the thing that impressed me with Penner is always his calmness and ability to get back up to the feet. So yes, he got taken down. He's extremely torn and lean at that weight. So it's not surprising that sometimes he can get taken down with someone who's five foot nine and got a pedigree wrestling skills like Munez. But the way he gets up and so calm, and he seems to look up at the ca uh, uh, at the uh, the big TV screens to see what arm position and what type of foot position uh, Munez had, and he's done this in numerous fights. If if you look back, you'll see him look up at the screen, and he pummels his arms accordingly, depending on what the position is, mm -hmm. and and that was quite quite different but such a such a calm calm guy that squeezes the pressure on from the feet have you noticed his cardio is really really incredible very, he scrambles up from it? his feet he under pummels he gets people up and he's straight away trying to crowd you with that length and range of his but like i say moon is for me i i felt like he was the one that won it i don't know what the people who watched it what they think but that's how i felt it was but penner is going to be hard to beat over five rounds for anyone i think three rounds okay you, you you could try to push it but i think over five rounds he could be potentially really really difficult customer to come across for anyone in that weight division yeah and i think he's got that an, an orthodox style as well which i quite like uh, yeah just quite enjoyable to watch as well there's penner but yeah i thought munez won uh next up was tracy cortez defeating justine kish via a split decision 29 28 28 29 29 28 um, yep. What do you make of this one? Yeah, a little bit surprised it was a split decision. I think Kish did well at times, but I thought Cortez looked really, really good. We know Cortez is great at you know wrestling. She's good on the ground, and um, you know she was showing those skill differences when they clinched up. She was taking Kish down, and she was controlling much of the aspect of the grappling. Lost control of Kish a couple of times, allowing Kish to get back to her feet. Because Kish, to me, always looked a little bit uncouth on her feet. Um, she just got very good cardio, got great drive and passion to try to win, um, but just didn't put her combinations together very cleanly for my liking. Um, when she was throwing like a, um, a right cross punch, a left hand would go wayward. When she would throw a kick, both her arms would drop down. She just didn't look very clinical or technically very, very uh, tight, but physically uh, she was in amazing shape and she really pushed it on Cortez. But Cortez really impressed me because also her striking where you might think Kish would have the advantage. I think Cortez conducted herself very, very well in the striking. And I think she, she's just showing that she's slowly becoming a well-rounded individual. I think she could be a force to be reckoned with in the future. I didn't agree with it being a split decision. For me, Cortez was the um, outright winner in this one. But yeah, sometimes the judges do have me scratching my head. Again, another one that I'd like uh, Paul Sutherland to put his perspective on it. 
yeah, just so we could get a better understanding of it. Um, but yeah, I agree. I think I, I thought it was Cortez's victory rather than a split. But I yeah. suppose at least they got the result you know, right, uh, ultimately. Um, yeah. Jacob Malcoon defeated Abdul Razak Al-Hazan via a unanimous decision, 30-27 across the board. What did you make of this? Yeah, Hassan, we know it's got some good striking, um, yes. but got kind of showing up a little bit like Holland. Holland's been found out by giving away his hips and his legs for the takedown guy. Uh, Malcoon got in on the hips and the legs with no real offensive, really. It was no just all too all, easy. Was it? No, it wasn't. And there was no ability in Al Hassan's game to, to adjust. So definitely things to work for. Uh, you know, in regards to him fighting in the future because people will look at that and they'll be targeting those hips and legs every single time because Marcoon he didn't have to do anything super context to get to get the die down didn't you know normally when you're getting um, you know into the wrestling range you want to get it down you normally have to fight and get yourself in some kind of physical deficit when you get him to the ground he had no such troubles against El Hassan he was getting him down with little effort and able to work quite an active top game yeah, and I think um, the thing with the likes of Holland and uh, Al Hassan, like for me, is you know we talked about Paddy earlier having an all-round game and the yeah. UFC being the cream of the crop, the world-class athletes. That is true, but if you put Paddy the Pimblet for for instance against a guy like Kevin Holland or uh, Al Hassan into and they were the same weight with yeah. the skill sets they've got. Paddy Pimblet wins nine times out of ten because he's well, able. To, he would just yeah. take them down and submit them all over. Yeah, know, absolutely. All day. But, 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 you know, technically they don't have the caliber to survive against someone like like him. Yeah, Paddy would just absolutely decimate him on the ground, and it, it it would be done in the first round as well. He'd put them away very very quickly. Um, but unfortunately, his vision yeah. is stacked with talent. Where they're good yeah, strikers, they're good, good wrestlers, good grapplers. It's a very very different division. Um, oh, I just, just reminded myself as well. Mason Jones is in the United States of America at the moment. Uh, right. I'm expecting a fight announcement anytime soon. Good uh, stuff. Just because he's out there, he, he'll be itching to get out because you know he was more mortified with um, how his debut in the UFC went from a result point of view. Um, you know, we know Mason can bang with the best of them, so yeah. he's going to be keen to make a point, I think, uh, coming into that second fight. So it'll be interesting who they match him up against. Um, but yeah, uh, overall, I thought um, Al Hassan just didn't have the skills to deal with Malcoon's takedowns, and no. it, it showed, uh, you know, over the fight. Over the fight. Um, next up was. Andre Olavsky, aged 250, defeated uh, Chase Sherman by unanimous decision. Olavsky marches on. The experienced man got it done. What yeah, did he did. And, um, you know, it's one of the ones that I won on my predictions, so I'm happy about that. But this was never an easy one. If you remember when we threw the predictions, I was like, oh, which way do I go here? Do I go with the young up and comer? Or do I stick young with up the and kind of, uh, young up and comer? Yeah. 31. Versus yeah. the experienced forty-two-year-old. Sure, yeah, and and forty-two. I mean, you you you, know, you really are cracking on years, but he kept himself in good shape overall, yeah, and yeah. still has pretty good reflexes, to be honest, and still got a, a decent enough chin. Um, yes, he has been finished a few times now as his age has marched on, but he's still got good chin about him, and yeah, you know, I think it, you know, it really is to behold what he's doing in that heavyweight yeah, division. Yeah, hundred percent. You know, I think he'll be the first to admit he's no longer the very, very top tier in the division. But for my money, he's still in the top fifteen all day long. And gate, um, gate, gate, gatekeeper for newcomers. Keeper. Yeah, like I think a, a, a possibly a little Tom, bit. Tom Aspinall, maybe. Yeah, 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 yeah. Possibly so. Yeah, um, but yeah, Lossky did impress me. But and the only thing I did observe about Lossky, and I hope that he puts it right, when you're so seasoned as such as he is, you know, your guard come a come. At, go a little bit wayward this is why i love going back to my boxing coach to re-establish where my hand position is to get my balance right and i sort of i always talk to him like it's i go back to you know taking my car for an mot making mm. sure everything's in order i just go back to my boxing coach every now and then just to make sure everything's in order i hope he goes back because he does pedal his hands and when i say pedal his hands he, he circles his hands like this 
And of course, with someone with good timing, that's a little sharp and, uh, and young as Sherman, you know, they'll come in. They will find your chin. They'll time the circle motion as it retracts down. I would like to see him keep and maintain those hands a little bit higher, a little bit tighter, like he used mm. to do back in his younger day. I just hope this is not a habit of age that's slowly creeping in because he'll get found out with these young wads. But nevertheless, he, still a great performance, though. And let's be fair, he only fought two months ago against um, Tom Aspinall. So to That's come right. out after yeah. after Tom Aspinall chugged him out to to come out yeah. and put on a three round you know win, I think yeah. he deserves a lot of credit for that. Just two months later, did he do enough to get a rematch against Tom Aspinall? And if you're Tom Aspinall, do you need to fight him again? Uh, I don't think Tom Aspinall needs to fight Oloski again. Um, I think Oloski should carry on fighting these up and coming youngsters. He's getting paydays. Oloski in the rankings still. He is, uh, I'm he? not too sure where he placed now. Okay. I'm surely, surely he's top 15. I think he's in the ranking. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see where he's ranked, and it'd be interesting to see where they'll position him after this win against Sherman, because Sherman was an up and comer. You know, he, mm. he, he was uh, getting himself for that division. Into he is, his... isn't he? I know. Like yeah. I joked, you know, 31 up and comer, but like for for heavyweights, like 31 yeah. is not old, is it? No, um, no, it's not. Let's have a look at the heavyweight division. So uh, Volkov, Rosenstruck. No, Arlovsky is technically not in the top 15, or he wasn't before last night. Uh, yeah. Tom Aspinall is. Yeah, I don't see there's a reason really for Tom Aspinall to be looking down now. No, he should be looking no. up all the way. Yeah. Uh, I would but, like to see him fight Walt Harris, by the way, just on a side note. Um, yeah, yeah, that would be a good one. But yeah, yeah. Uh, Arlovsky, I thought, did very well. Can still take a punch. Still fit as a fiddle, aged 42, yeah. by the way. Because in that yeah. third round, he was bouncing around doing he low was, kicks. He was, up, and he was up on his feet. Enjoy Joe it, what? Alofsky's mouth was a little bit open, so he was definitely working hard in there. But he shook off instead of becoming stuck stuck in the mud. Maybe this is mm. the way he's dealing with the fact that he is getting older. Rather than standing your ground, fighting in the pocket, which takes a bit of energy to do to do that, he's yeah. choosing to get on his bike and sit behind his jab. And if you have a look in that fight, his jab was actually really, really successful. There was many times in the fight that he was landing a double jab. Um, and the only thing that was a little bit different from what, what he Lofsky would normally do to his game, he was coming forward with those flurries and, and losing some power off his shots, but coming with these flurries, it w was leaving him a little bit exposed and against a hard returning hitter that's got mm. some accuracy could get himself in trouble doing it like that I wasn't a fan of that sort of style that he was bringing um, but his jab was working really really well I liked it he was um, getting on his bike to stay out of trouble and stick behind that jab in the latter round he still did some really really good things and I'm really happy for him I've always been a fan of Lofsky and I'm glad that he's still relevant and got a few fights still left in him yeah 100% mate and I thought he really looked like he was enjoying it I've got to say yeah he, he did like he looked genuinely like as if he was kind of at this point where he's like yeah do you know what I am coming to the end of my career but I'm mean, going to enjoy it why not why yeah. shouldn't I yeah. enjoy it absolutely um, the main event of the evening Robert Whittaker fought Kelvin Gastelum what did you make of this yeah, again, another one that I predicted correctly, Sorry. Well done. Um, just got to say that. Um, yeah, Gaslam always amazes me because he's just five foot nine in this division, and, and that's not very big for, for a middleweight. Um, but he has packed on some size in his upper body, but he's lacking a little bit in the legs department. And Gaslam, we know what he's going to do. We know what he wants. He, he wants to come in heavy with those hands. But against Whitaker, who's taller, rangier, and really, really fit, he's, he's an incredible athlete, Robert Whitaker. He's got bags and bags of cardio. But the thing is, he doesn't abuse his cardio where he just pushes hard down and, and just goes at a ferocious pace. He always holds it back. He just does the right amount of work according to the circumstance. And that circumstance was Kevin Gaslam always having to chase to try and get in the pocket for which he was getting successes in the first minute and a half of the first round. But yeah. thereafter, Whitaker started sussing him out and actually ca catching him on the way in. Gaslam was always potentially dangerous. Um, I think out of the two of them, Gaslam's the one with the bigger dynamite in his hands. And that's what he had to try to hit home with. And Whitaker knew that. And Whitaker was not afraid to get on his bike 
and pedal around like we saw Olosky doing that final round. Whitaker was footworking around as and when needed to, fighting in the pocket as and when he needed to. But the nice thing about what I saw Whitaker do, which goes to show how high IQ his camp is and he is, is that he brought something new to every round. In the first round, he just established himself with his hands. He started introducing kicks to the latter part of that first round. And in the second round, getting successes with the head kick. In the third and fourth round, he started introducing knees. And he started introducing takedowns as well in, in, in rounds three, four, and five. This guy just had it all together. He was hacking in at the legs, the body, the head. He was giving it all, including the wrestling. It was really, really impressive. Likewise, on the flip side of that, I was really impressed with Gaslam was choosing to try to make attempts to take uh, to take Whitaker down. But like I said for my predictions, I felt like Whitaker was just too good all round, and I think his physical height advantage, his athleticism advantage, was going to um, ring ring um, through for him, and indeed it did. I wasn't disappointed with Gaslam. I think Gaslam, like I say, just does so well when you think that his stature is so short against such potential big adversaries but Whitaker in my mind he's he's absolutely earned his right to fight um Adesanya now he, he, we've got to get that fight on yes 100% um Robert Whitaker I thought mate just looks like it looks a little bit refreshed as if that yeah, does. um that loss and maybe he gave him a little I don't know so a little injection of something yeah he's uh, looked better and better each he fight looks looks back to himself and um, yes, that's he does. what we want ultimately is Robert Whittaker at his A game so we can make that uh, that title rematch happen at some point because yeah. that's a you know, it's a great fight isn't it? Uh, to, to yeah. potentially look forward to but uh, Whittaker just impresses me how fit he is like yeah. this was quite an active fight and like five rounds in and he's still able to shuffle along the floor with Gastelum on top of him. He's still able yeah. to move his feet quick enough when he's on his Absolutely, feet. Absolutely, yeah. Conditioning out of this world, mate, i got to yeah, say. Yeah, it is. Impresses it is. me and every time. Because these are not know, small not, guys either. No, he's not. You know, if you have a look at you know, his, his legs and upper body, that equally quite thick set. He's, he's got incredible athletic frame. Um, but, you know, oh, have I lost you? Oh, I, do, I think just went blank then. You still got me? Yeah, I still got you. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, w when you look at his frame, you know, he must have to cut a little bit of weight, but this guy obviously lives a very, very clean life. He obviously mm. trains very, very hard at all times. Um, yeah, he, he he's in this sport. Fit, well, with the, any of those fighters are in the sport ultimately for quite a long part, uh, a, a short part of their life in terms of a of a working career. And he's taken himself completely serious. You know you know and you can trust that every time he steps in that cage, he's going to be in top-tier shape. I just think he's rehomed his skills, resharpened his confidence, and he's ready for the title now. Yeah, me too. I agree completely. Um, so, uh, a very interesting weekend of fights, mate. And uh, obviously we had uh, another top guest from uh, the MMA world, which I really enjoyed. Really enjoyed having a chat to Aiden. so I thank him for giving us uh, an hour or so of his time. I had a really interesting little chat with him. And, of course, we talked Jake Paul, Ben Askren, Bellator, UFC, and a few little news. But we'll be back next week for another episode of the Danny Brown Fight Show. And joining us will be Cage Warriors featherweight champion, Mr. Jordan the Epidemic Vucenic. Cannot wait, because it's always a good time. I love talking to the man, so it's going to be always a good time. Could be a long one because we end up just talking instead of doing what we're supposed to be doing. <laughs> but uh, it's going to be good. It's going to be good. Looking forward to it. Uh, we'll be back next Wednesday. Join us. Until then, Danny, as always, a pleasure, my friend. Yeah. Thanks, I. Thanks for all the listeners. And thanks, Adrian Jones, for being on. It's been an absolute pleasure this weekend. really has. Quality, mate. See you later. Bending champion, welcome.